after yesterday I went home, I didn't go to the conference, I rewrote my talk because everyone had been talking about what I was going to talk about, so I have to change my view and say something new. Uh, here's the plan. I'm, I, there's far too much in this talk, I'm just barely going to be able to get through it, but I'll give it a shot. And I'll tell you about, about the view in the book that I just finished. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, what I think conceptual engineering is and how I see the connection between that and conceptual activism. Actually, this slide didn't get changed the right way. It should also include conceptual disease management. That's the part I really want to get to. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about why, what I think is problematic about the thing I call conceptual activism. And I'll say a bit about why I think that matters. So, so I think it's important that these issues of control, allow to control, uh, why it's important, something I call the revisionist predicament. <clears throat> and then I'll talk about a new field, which is a kind of activism. I don't talk about this in the book. Uh, you can think of it as a kind of disease management. And it's important that I get to that part. So I'll keep an eye on time here. And I'll talk about two objections. Uh, OK, so this is uh, part one. So I, I think of conceptual engineering, you know, there are many ways to sort of carefully formulate it, but think of it as a, one part of it, the study of how to assess and improve representation, or just how you could do that as one part, and then the doing of it, actually assessing and improving. Conceptual activism, you, you've, you've found some defective things, you have some thoughts about how to improve, uh, and you try to implement those improvements. That's the activism part. And there's another thing that I'm, this is the part I want to get to, where you figure out, look, I can't really change it, but I have to figure out how to live with it. Uh, so I got this conceptual disease, and, and how do I relate to other people, and how does it get integrated into my own life? Uh, and that's the conceptual disease management. It's a kind of chronic disease, it's incurable. Uh, you figure out how to live with it. When I started this project, it was a kind of way to think about uh, tradition that I saw sort of stretching from uh, Carnap, uh, Wittgenstein, Frege, the origin of analytic philosophy, sort of the book I use, uh, uh, Clark and Chalmers, as a, as a kind of paradigm. I, I know that might not be completely true to what uh, Dave was intending, but I think uh, it's, a, it's a really nice example. Explication is an excellent example. Sally's work is a paradigm. Uh, I like people who are revisionist about moral language. I think moral language is defective along some dimension. And here is my job as a philosopher is to try to figure out improvements. I really like also uh, Sarah Jane Leslie's work in generics. It's a kind of empirically informed project that says, look, here are these provable, you know, allegedly provable, bad cognitive effects of using a certain kind of expression. And here are some strategies for how to improve children's lives. So I'm going to get back to that uh, towards the end. Uh, okay, so there's a whole bunch of examples that we've already, many of uh, already been mentioned. I didn't say much about building concepts from scratch, the de novo strategy that Dave was talking about. And I, at some point, I sent the, the manuscript to Dave, and I got back this email. I was like, why don't you talk about that? And I thought, yeah, I should have done that. But then I have to rewrite the whole book, so I'm not going <laughs> to. I don't know how to do that. Uh, so I was thinking this was my little, you know. I was trying to relate to that tradition that took something that was there, found defects and improvements, and then issues that came up was, how do you do that? What's being fixed? Uh, what are defects and virtues? What are the limits of revision? What supports topic continuity? And what are these things, topics? What is the role of words and their effects on people? What are the connections between exploitation of lexical effects and conceptual engineering? I'm going to talk more about this later. Uh, but this is a cluster of issues that came up thinking about the tradition that I started with. And it didn't seem that I had to say very much about creating from scratch in order to start on this. But I do think that we should aim for a unified theory. Uh, and uh, it's important that this book is an essay. Uh, it's called uh, an essay on cassette. So it's, yeah, it's an effort. It's a beginning. I think uh, there's a lot more to be done uh, here. I'm going to give you a brief uh, eight-point overview of the central points in the book, because the rest of what I'm going to say won't make much sense if you don't have that. Uh, first part, uh, every theory of conceptual engineering should include what I think of as a dynamic metasemantics. So that's on account of what is being assessed, what these things, concepts, or meanings. 
lexical items plus meaning pairs, you know, some object of assessment is. And then how changes to those things happen. So the dynamic part, how you can, you know, there's, there's this here, and then there's some kind of mechanism of change as the dynamic component. I propose, and I focus on uh, two kinds of semantic values or combination of them, changes in extensions and intentions is just Think of intentions as functions from points of evaluation, uh, two sets or some other thing where you can be somewhat neutral about what points of assessment are. I, I have views about that, but the book doesn't depend on it. So in a way, it treats semantic change analogous with reference change. Uh, and all the illustrations that I gave you, that long list that I didn't go through, it involves changes in intention within us. Uh, sometimes those changes would involve keeping the lexical item, sometimes not, and those are interesting choice points, but I'm not going to talk more about it here, but that's part of something you want a theory here to cover. When is it important to keep the lexical item and then also I think this stuff about words is really important. I operate, I try to sort of motivate the project within a kind of externalist uh, meta-semantics that I don't have anything original, really, to say about. We're not much. It's, that's not what the book is about. The basic idea is, is these things that are meanings don't supervene on the individual. This is familiar literature that I appeal to. Um, maybe the part of it that, I, that I'm quite sympathetic to, but nothing really depends a lot on it, is that it also, it's the semantic values we have now depend in part on the future. Lots of things that are going to happen in the future and maybe also in other possible worlds. So these are factors that uh, go into determining the semantic values and the view, I think. But as you'll see, m maybe the book is a little bit too explicit about my own commitments, because they, they don't matter all that much for what I'm going to go on to do. So it's important that these uh, Metasemantic mechanisms allow for change. That's why I wanted a dynamic metasemantics. Now, the externalist tradition did that from the beginning. It was like the first sort of issues that Kripke worried about was the changes in reference. And uh, so it's always possible. I think there's going to be a lot of it, but it's still going to be externalist. And it's, uh, this is a I think somewhat original part of this view. It's that the mechanisms for semantic change, they change too. So, so the, the, there, think of there being these meta-meta-semantic mechanisms that determine what meta-semantics we have. And those meta-meta-semantic mechanisms can change the nature of the meta-semantics. I think there's flux at every level here, not just in the semantic value being changed by certain mechanisms, but those mechanisms aren't fixed forever. So in this theory, uh, concepts don't play much of a role. Not the sort of things that psychologists call concepts. Uh, and not really much of what in the philosophical traditions uh, has been called concept. Though some people would be happy to call some of these things concepts. <coughs> Topics are important because uh, I have these changes. And you want to see continuity. What counts as continuity in those changes? And I call it topic continuity. So on the view I propose, the semantic value of, of some predicate or a term can change, but we're still talking about that thing. Uh, so if, uh, if the extension, and in, not just extension in like who happens to be a family at that particular time, but the function that goes from a point of assessment to families, if that changes, there's still families. So the semantic value, the in intention can change, but we still have this way of talking where we say, well, there's still families. And so that's the topic continuity as the semantics changes. And I think it's really hard to understand that. That's a big kind of mysterious part. I just, I call it topic continuity. I say it's essentially contested. It, the rules for topic continuity are not fixed. They are open for debate and revision along the way as well. And topics are the most mysterious part of this book. I don't, they're not semantic values. They're not things I don't think you can really even refer to them. It's a weird part of the view. This is a, a reply to Strawson objection. That's a big part of the book, where Strawson objected to Carnap that 
explication was always a change of topic, and I say, no, and the, this theory is supposed to tell you why. But I have a little bit to say about topics. It's tied for me very closely to same saying and disquotational indirect reporting, so it's not like I don't have anything to say about it, uh, but anyway, that's an important component of the book. Uh, I'm getting to the end of this overview now soon. Uh, lexical effects are not about changing the meanings of anything. So these are efforts to exploit the non-cognitive, non-semantic, non-chromatic effects of words. I think this is really important, so I talk a lot about it. Uh, but it's not conceptual engineering as I've construed it, because that always involved a change of the semantic value. And these cases don't do that. So I'm trying to separate those things. It's interesting to think about the connection between them, but uh, for me, the study of lexical effects is, is separate. So it's important that these are non often non-cognitive effects, the sort of things that metaphor can give you, and slurs at least can give you. That might not be the whole theory of slur, but it certainly does have those emotional uh, non-cognitive effects. Uh, they're not the sort of thing we talk about in semantics. They're not pragmatic contents like presuppositions or implicatures or any of those categories from pragmatics. I mean, unless you use pragmatic to just mean everything that's not semantic. Uh, but it's not the kind of contents that pragmatic theories typically deal in. So the thought is that when you hear words or see words like vegan, Coca-Cola, fart, child, or even philosophical terms, 2D semantics, x -fi, you sort of get feelings and associations and you connect yourself with various things in interesting ways and that lots of linguistic behavior is governed by efforts to exploit these lexical effects. Oh, but it's important to see that that isn't the other thing I was talking about, the effort to change um, semantic values. The, uh, another theme in this is that as these changes happen, I think it's possible to describe them, and the right way to describe them isn't as just there is a word of a particular natural language that has changed its meaning. Uh, I think we can disquote and say that as, family as the term family changes its semantic value, there is a true thing you can say by taking away the quotation marks and say that families have changed. And so I try to explain why that is. And so then you've changed families. <laughs> You change the world. Uh, that just sounds really weird and mysterious, but, but what it really means is you, you're free to take away those quotation marks and say something true. So I call that the worldly construal of conceptual engineering, and it's important to contrast that with the view where all we're doing is there are some sequences of letters, and the goal is to change some theoretical entity attached to those sequences of letters. Because I find that to be somewhat less interesting uh, than to change the families are. Okay, so that's the overview of the of the of the book. And then uh, many of the talks, uh, some of the talks yesterday were, were about this uh, idea that uh, the externalism in the book makes certain kind of activism impossible. And and I do there is a version of that that I think is true, and then that's what I'm going to talk about right now. And then in the last part of the talk, I'm going to um, talk about it, another kind of activism that I think is, is not impossible. So, yeah, get my tea. Okay, so take any particular case. The idea of, of a word, like family. The idea is that the, 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 the facts that determine that particular expression uh, are often epistemically uh, we have little or no epistemic access to them and very little control. So, so to give you a sense of what I'm thinking about, uh, here's, a, here's a, a toy example. So there's, there's this predicate, foots. So there's a property that supervenes on the patterns of feet of people in China 100 years into the past and 100 years into the future. So changes in this property, foots depends in some sense on changes to the total pattern of positioning of Chinese feet. So this over a 100 year period. Super complicated, right? Um, so this is inscrutable, and we have very little control of it. So we cannot know the exact foot patterns. Uh, it's just, we just, there is no way to access all those feet over that whole period. They're just not something that we know anything about. 
and we have super little control over it. Uh, we don't even know the exact supervenience relation. So even if God told us the complete pattern of feet positioning over a 100-year period, we wouldn't know how to go from that to, to the property, because I haven't told you the step from the supervenience base to the object. So foots activists face a problem. Like, if you really wanted to change this property, um, so it's, it's inaccessible. Uh, the things in the past are unchangeable. It's sort of like the Second World War. You might think it's awful, but look, you, just nothing you can do about it. So the past positioning is not something you have much control over. And even if we start from now and we start saying, OK, we're going to start changing these feet positions, you know, we might put a few people's feet in certain positions, but they were massively intrusive, and they'd probably cheat a lot uh, when we weren't looking. And we don't even know the supervenience relation. So even if we could start doing this, uh, we'd be not so far along. Because I'm thinking that words have a little bit of the same problem. Uh, the meaning of an expression, say, family, depends on patterns of use over time. I like this passage from, from Williamson, although meanings may supervene on use, there is no algorithm for calculating the former from the latter, or, or maybe the algorithm is just so complex that we can't grasp it, we're just not smart enough. I mean, it's now a computer program playing Go that maybe is so, it's, it's doing it in a way we just can't understand, it's just too hard for us to understand. Now why would this algorithm be, be any easier than that? This is like massively harder than Go. I mean, we do have some general ideas, but we know hardly any details about the billions of uses of family, and we don't know the algorithm uh, which those uses, so, through which those uses generate semantic values. And then remember, the doubly dynamic metasemantics, where uh, even the, the mechanism that gets you there could change over time. So that makes the, adds complexity to this. So the, the actual mechanism itself is in flux. So even if you knew it at one point, it could change. So this is not about internalism versus externalism. I try to make a point out of that. And say, like, my, my own commitments are very externalist, but it really doesn't matter. It's about uh, control or lack of control. You could have an internalist view that left you completely out of control. It could be internal factors that you have no control over whatsoever. <coughs> or there could be external factors that give you complete control. Like, it was all about the movement of this phone from here to here, then that's external, but I have super control over it. Uh, so it isn't about internal versus external at all. So the principle is called lack of control. It's not absence of control. I mean, I'm not denying that if God was here, we could make changes. Uh, and it's not that it's impossible. It's just really, really hard. Uh, happens all the time. Uh, but these are changes um, that are difficult for us. And, and if you did want to change semantic values, there are two additional uh, challenges. And, and I'll say a little bit about each of those. Suppose you like a view, and I, I haven't motivated this yet because it's not really a part of my view, but if you think there are some concepts that are bedrock or basic or there are some kind of conceptual fixed points, so the idea is those are, those are concepts that don't reduce to anything else and they're so fundamental that when you think you'd have to have them in place for the rest of the system to start working. Uh, these can't be revised. And so if there are defects at that fundamental level, and you believe in a fundamental level. And that's another way into this lack of control issue. And, and there might be many versions of this bedrock view. I'm not going to uh, go through all of them. And the final is that there's a kind of lack of training. We're not particularly trained at changing these use patterns. So even you know, something we wanted to do, that wouldn't be the sort of thing that we're particularly well positioned to do. So it's not the kind of thing. Uh, that we're in a good position to do. So that's, that's, that's the, the view. And now, I had a, my student, Sigurd, he was asking me, I was like, like why, why do you care so much about this control issue? What's the big deal about it? He said, to me, I think that's a good question, so I'll try to explain why I think this is important. Um, so suppose, just to take an example, I'll give you more examples later, but suppose moral language is inherently defective along some important dimension. 
suppose we can't fix it, or at least not by December or within a couple of years or decades. So we're pretty much stuck with it for the foreseeable future. And we just, we just have to keep using it because other people talk to us. We just don't know how to communicate with people in other ways. So then we have what I'll call the revisionist predicament. Um, you can recognize an ineliminable defect and also that you can't do anything about it. This is a general phenomenon, I think. Like many of those who spend time thinking and talking about large-scale normative matters should do so without holding too much hope that their talking and thinking will have significant or predictable effects on the relevant aspects of the world. So we often have normative opinions, and we just end up thinking there's nothing we can do about it. But I do think there's something special here. It's got something to do with uh, the human rationality and the intellect. So it highlights, I think, a disturbing limitation of the human intellect and rationality. We're animals who pride ourselves on our rationality. The ability to think and represent is arguably at the core of that rationality. And that ability enables us to recognize both that our own representational devices are defective and that there isn't much we can do about it. So our intellect can diagnose itself, figure out a cure, but it's impotent when it comes to doing anything. That's an interesting feature uh, of human intellectual life. And it leads to this final part that I think <laughs> I haven't, didn't talk much about in the book. Uh, but it is a form of activism, I think. And I'll, I'll call it conceptual disease uh, management. So think of these conceptual deficiencies as diseases that are incurable, at least for now. We don't know how to fix them, so we just have to figure out how to live with them for a while. And so now there's this, this genuine practical question, how do we live with conceptual defects? But I think, do you think that question and the answers to it, are, those are forms of activism. Right? Because they have to, they're things you have to do to yourself and to other people. I'll, I'll talk more about what those things are in a little bit. Uh, and that is, that is a genuine theoretical and practically important uh, uh, Issue. So if there's a so, so here's the revised version of my view. I think the sort of large scale changing of semantic values. That's not the point to particularly pursue. But this management of defects is a massively pressing important issue, and it is a form of, of activism, if you, if you want to use the term in that way. So here are some levels at which this becomes important. It's an important at a personal level how to manage your own thoughts, speech, choices, and actions. So to get some more cases, suppose normative language or gendered language or generics or other forms of generalizations have important defects. You know you can't change them. Uh, you use these concepts to think about the world around us, to articulate plans and choices, and to communicate with others. So they have massive effects on our actions and theorizing. And so, and arguably, they're unavoidable. So here's a challenge for each of us in each of these domains, and how do we go about our lives while well, knowing that we do so with concepts that are defective? And the answer will depend in large part on the nature of the defect and the particular context. So this is a very large scale kind of talk about, <laughs> about an issue, but, it's, but it is a, uh, the nature of how pressing it is and the kind of things you do will depend on uh, details of the particular domains, I think. And then there are things about how we relate to other people. So you can now start thinking, what are your normative obligations with respect to talking to others, using those defective concepts? If you use a term or even mention it, are you harming these interlocutors? And the answer, again, will depend in large part about the particular case and the context and so on. But these are not theoretical issues. They're genuine. Uh, practical issues that come out of conceptual engineering as I think about it. There's also the issue of how to avoid contamination from others. So others will talk to you using the defective concepts and then even if you don't want to, those thoughts will come into your head. Uh, so they will sort of contaminate you without you being able to, to stop them. Um, but how do we avoid that kind of contamination? Do we just not listen to them, or do we listen and do something? Those are, again, genuine practical issues, I think. I think it's also 
So, so I think the, the picture people might get from the book and from the talks yesterday was I think conceptual engineering is this purely theoretical thing that we do that has no practical or real life implications. I think it has massive real life implications. Uh, so here's another uh, version. I think huge implications for how we think about children, like how we teach children language, what we say to our children, because one, one thing about children, they don't already have, they're not already contaminated. Uh, so, so it's very important for, for how to think about education. So Sarah Jane Leslie has, for those of you who know her work, has this view that the use of certain kinds of quantifier expressions are cognitively harmful. So generics make you think poorly uh, in various ways. And so I don't, she doesn't articulate it like this, but she's like the most extreme conceptual engineer ever. It's like she's like, okay, what we have to do is like some large scale re-education of children. And that, that's her, you just have to stop talking to them a certain way. And, for, and that is just one example. If you think these defects are widespread, these issues about how to engage with children is important. Okay, I'm gonna get through everything. Then we'll get to, to objections. So the first is, okay, I've been, I haven't told you about any particular defects. I haven't gone into particular cases. So you know, maybe this still is just a totally theoretical thing. There are these Maybe concepts could be defective, it's possible, but they are few and far between. It's not something that's going to be a pressing part of anyone's life. This is still idle theoretical speculation, not serious practical issues. No real activism is needed. See, I was uh, upset that Motti took my Nietzsche quote uh, from us. This is the thing we started, uh, uh, that David and I start the introduction to, to the volume with. Um, I'm not going to read it again. Uh, but, but, but I do, th so, so the spirit here is, the, the, you know, the point that at the end here, um, so he sort of concludes, what is needed is, ab above all, is an absolute skepticism towards all inherited concepts. So Nietzsche talks a lot about how stupid and unreliable the ancestors were. Um, but I don't think you have to commit some kind of genetic fallacy in order to get this. Absolute skepticism. So I'm going to say you should. You really should have absolute skepticism. I, I did genuinely believe that. Uh, not exactly for these Nietzschean type reasons, but here are some general reasons. So I told you there's some algorithm that takes you from some extremely complex use pattern to meanings. I never sign on to that. I've, I have no idea what that. I don't. I don't trust that pattern. I have no good reason to think it's a good thing. Um, I have no allegiance to it, and I have no reason to trust that it serves my purposes or adheres to my values. I have two more minutes. Okay. Um, and then when we start looking at particular cases, almost every domain we start thinking about, and forget about philosophy for a moment, just think about law, psychiatry, uh, uh, all kinds of ordinary speech, we find various kinds of significant defects. So there's a kind of inductive argument, and there's a general argument. Uh, that I think support general uh, attitude of skepticism towards what you have. So, so in sum, uh, I don't think this is just a theoretical idol. I think it's a real genuine threat. And I think even if, even if you can't fix it, the thing that's a serious activist issue is how to live with it. And then, I mean, there's a million things to keep talking about since I have uh, 60 seconds left. This is going to be the, the last one. But it, it does have this weird self-reflective, potentially undermining concern that comes up. So maybe that if, if you should be so skeptical, as I just said, and you should have this Nietzschean, complete, total skepticism, <laughs> shouldn't you be skeptical of all this terminology that I'm using to even articulate these issues? Uh, what about concepts and defects and diseases and management or all these terms? The terms that I am using to articulate uh, disease management as an issue should itself be suspect. Uh, so you should turn this whole project on itself. Uh, and what do you do? Well, you just get dizzy and you keep going.
I mean, we also we have a bunch of hands, so I just suggest we we sort of get started. So why doesn't Sally start? Oh, <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. So um, um, we we sort of just avoid Zero. the number project. Oh. <laughs> really? I think can we can we just Dave? Why don't, do you have that thing? Yes, I've got, a, I've got a, I have a randomized list of numbers here, but will only work. Okay, if you so are you get the, then you get the number, the, you, you, you do the randomization and you get the number in line. Okay, put your hand up again. We'll do the so whole thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay, Okay, but, yeah. But, um, does anyone, everyone know the number? Okay, this one, this is the start of number 8. Number 8. Okay, 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 the examples you used, but I was wondering about the uh, heavily semantic focus of the uh, of the way the issues were put. I mean, it seemed to me that a, an alternative way of thinking about it, which I, I find more natural, is that we just need need to revise our uh, practice and. The issues about the uh, semantics are are basically just issues about well, if we revised our our uh, practice, um, how how do we um, uh, translate the old vocabulary into the new vocabulary that we're currently using in the practice, and and there's going to be a lot of in return, tendency there, and 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 so this <coughs> way of uh, looking at it seems to me to update all all the issues about uh, what the old semantic values were and 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 so forth. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I knew what the the practice was more precisely, then it would be easier to to engage with. But so, in, so can we? I mean, to take a an initial, somewhat paradigmatic case, the uh, well, it's like to carn up on explication. I don't know what the practice is there that's independently of the sharpening and the refinement and the kind of things that involve changing extensions. That was the whole point. You needed something that had a different kind of semantic property, and then with sharpness. And so that's what the that's what the explication tradition is entirely about. Now, take a really different example. Sarah Jane's stuff on generics, and there, uh, the, the 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 thought is that the speech. It's, I mean, the picture is. I don't know that this is true, but here's the here's the view she has. It's that just hearing these generic sentences, just like goes into you, and then it like does something to you. And so, the practice there is to to change the way we use quantifiers, and that's. I don't know was that part of the practice or not, but that was one of the things that I was I, I was thinking. And then and we could go through different other cases, but I'm thinking that the connection between the thing called the practice and the semantic values will maybe differ from case to case. And I'm not, I don't, I mean, none of this is to say that, I mean, yeah, there's like 60,000 children that die from malnutrition every day, and I don't think conceptual engineering will help them uh, much. So there is practice that, you know, just don't even start listening to me. You should just go and give them food. So 
and if that's more important than anything having to do with these issues. So is that what you mean, that there are practical issues oh, that are more important? Well, what I, or, I, no? I, 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 I meant involve the linguistic practice, so of course it, it uh, connects out, out with the social practice too. But so in the uh, Sarah Jane and Leslie case, I just meant the, the revision she is calling for is uh, dropping the use of generics. And then the question of how we, how we um, attach semantic values to the old generic sentences uh, uh, just uh, loses its interest. Probably there is no coherent way to do that. Um, uh, the task of uh, finding a coherent semantics for the earlier language yeah. uh, uh, doesn't seem all that I, Okay, so then I think it's not such, so I think sometimes when you find a, de find a defect, one of the things you'll want to do is just get rid of that. You're just gonna start doing something else uh, in in uh, in other cases, take yeah. If truth is defective or moral language is defective, that doesn't seem to be an option. So there, it's a little hard to see what the appeal to practice is going to be. But look, it, big issues about what practice is and so. Uh, number fifteen. Uh, I'll nominate myself to be fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I was fifteen to go. <laughs> Skepticism, which I'm totally cool with and agree is, uh, you know, anything that you're more cynical. But so much better than how do you get around so well? It seems like it's just a similar problem of miracles that we have in uh, an analogous case of philosophy of science. So how do we get around so well? Yes, yeah, all of our concepts are so defective. Um, then why do we communicate so well and are able to um, actually engineer society pretty well? You know, the subway is only like mostly don't work. <laughs> <laughs> and all, all of our concepts are equally defective. I mean, one way of hearing that for me is that we have like, tons of false beliefs about these concepts. Lots of wrong information. But still, there's got to be a core that's good enough, you know, we're, we're all dressed in um, So I'm wondering how you can put together just both these things. But I like the idea that most of our concepts are crappy. Uh, okay, so so I get the question. Not, uh, I don't have a general answer to the connection between these conceptual deficiencies on the one hand and the total pattern of human <coughs> way of life on the other. I, I I guess I'm a little bit. I don't know the perspective from which things are going so well. I, I mean, it could be infinitely better along almost every dimension, and maybe conceptual deficiencies have something to do with that. But just how it is compatible with the parts that work. Um, I, a great question. I don't, have, I don't have a general answer for you. So that's okay. for thinking more about. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is a question about living with the disease. So um, sometimes I think that, that winds up being the cure. And then the question is sort of how we should live. So um, there was a paucity of good vocabulary for the human personality for a long time in English. Uh, the word trait was originally a word that was used for pen, you know, and it came to be applied metaphorically with the cast of someone's personality. Um, and then that metaphorically just got folded into the word, the meaning of the word trait after a sort of repeated use. Um, why did that happen? Why did we start using trait in a sort of stock metaphorical way? Well, presumably our concepts and vocabulary for the human personality before that were somehow less efficient, less expressive of what we wanted to be expressing. There was something deficient about it. So is that a case of conceptual interference? Um, so here's a version of that question, if I understand it right. So, so sometimes we improve by creating new co concept. Is that, is that part of it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but or revise it's something that. Effect. It was it's originally like electrical effect. It's a metaphorical way to sort of get a gestalt across, right. um, gets folded, got folded into the meaning of the word. Yeah. There was meaning change. Okay, so that sounds like a case where some good thing happened, something that was useful, a meaning change that ended up being quite useful maybe for us happened. So that doesn't seem to be an example of living with the deceased. That sounds like some, you know, where we, we found, we found like a strategy for improvement. Right. Yeah, and I, I was, so this, 
thought isn't that nothing good ever happens. It's sometimes good, you have a great example. Sometimes when good things happen, I just don't think it was something that if we wanted to start doing that now, we would be in much control of it or know much about how to do it or create the kind of use patterns that generated the transition from it being metaphorical or whatever to it having it, that as a semantic value. That's that. That's all right. I just I'm extremely difficult was close to what I was saying. Extremely unpredictable. A small group of us here <laughs> wouldn't have much of a chance to affect any of those changes. That's roughly the the view. That doesn't mean you shouldn't keep trying. Or that part of the view is you keep trying to do that too. I don't think we should never keep trying. Uh, I think it's a, a natural thing for humans to to keep trying to do extremely difficult things. So this isn't. The thought wasn't all we should do is disease management. It's that you know, if you do, if you try to change the way uh, gendered language or language used to talk about um, skin color, for example, is is used across English speakers in the world, your chance of having a predictable success. I mean, you will have some effect. It just the exact effect of your actions will be very hard to measure, even across the entire span of your life. But does it mean you shouldn't keep doing that? I think it's the natural thing for people to keep doing. We do it to ourselves, trying to affect our children all the time. Even though we know hardly anything we do will have any effect on them, but we can't not do it, and we shouldn't not do it, even though we know that it just won't make much of a difference. So you keep doing that. But there's this other thing that you also, I think, really have to, you know, given how extremely hard it is, how extremely unlikely it is, you need to figure out how to live with it. But does that address the issue at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that I just wondered, like, it seems like I already knew that, so... Um, I, maybe yeah. this is completely obvious, but it, it is an element of conceptual engineering that we hadn't quite talked about before. So I thought just adding that is so the conceptual engineering part, there's the trying to fix the thing part, and then there's the just living with the disease part. Those seem to raise somewhat separate issues, and a sort of taxonomy of conceptual engineering should include some structure to that last part. Number three. That was, must have put someone here. Um, okay, I'll be on the screen. Okay, number one. Um, um, I just want to get a bit clearer on what you think about uh, about use as a uh, as a lever here for control. I mean, I think what you said about it explicitly is we don't know the algorithm by which meaning depends on use or use and other factors. But of course, that's true. But not knowing the algorithm is consistent with knowing an awful lot. About it, I think you know one thing, which is you know, it's very widely believed meaning at least depends in part on use and depends in part also on a whole bunch of external factors. And I also think it's very plausible that we know enough that if you change the use enough in a certain direction, you thereby change the meaning in that direction, at least by and large. So you know, all the standard cases for externalism, very few of them, uh, you know, show you that uh, meaning is totally robust over changes in use. So that at least suggests a project for anyone who's interested in engaging in this kind of conceptual activism, just try and change, try and change the use um, in enough people. Um, my own view is it's very plausible. If you change the use enough, um, then you'll change the meaning in that direction. There's also the point that I think Jared made yesterday, which is even if you don't, even if because of externalism, you don't end up changing the meaning by changing the, you know, the narrow use enough people, you're going to achieve most of the practical goals of conceptual engineering. So I'm just 
curious what you think about that. I'm, I'm less, I'm just, so, so you're so, to give a, an adequate answer, I'd have to give you a theory about how I think the pattern of use generates uh, semantic values, and I, I don't have this. So, so here's a here's a possibility. Uh, there are practical strategies that are implementable by a group of academics or some larger group of people that, in some predictable way, can change the use pattern sufficient to change semantic values. So that, that this is just the first part of the question. Uh, I just don't know about any strategies like that, and I don't know enough about how the use pattern generates semantic values. So just to give an example of how hard I think it is, do you, what do you think about all the tokens of family and gendered terms that occur in computer screens and, and that are programmed into computer programs all around the world and that occur? Can't be the amount of tokens. I just, I don't, when I start thinking about the details of a strategy like that, I, I just wouldn't know where to start. Now, I, you maybe have a theory, and that would be, you know, this is a kind of provocative way of putting things, so great, if someone can write down some way of doing that, you know, more power to you. I actually don't have a theory, but I think what's plausible, and then yeah. I also agree that changing the use is extremely difficult. Yeah. I do think that it's antecedently very plausible to change the use enough, and you will change the meaning. I agree that there is some pattern of behavior we can engage in such that that pattern of behavior will eventually lead to a change or contribute to a change. I mean, not just our behavior, but other social and structural and natural factors combined with that behavior. Yes, but I think we're back to like, that's extremely, there's not something that's gonna happen by December or you know, next academic year. So for now, let's try to focus on how to live with the defects. So as a sharing policy, I don't think we should take fingers and accumulate more than Otherwise, like the dominant strategy for everyone is going to be a finger. So the next number is six. Oh, thanks. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about this idea that the whole meta semantics is also in flux because I was a little puzzled about it also in the book. I didn't really get the idea. So does that mean that, for example, at one point a causal theory of reference gives you a good explanation of what fixes the reference of names, but then in, in 100 years it might not or something like that? Or what, what does it mean? Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to write more about that, but I, you know, uh, I just wanted to talk about all the different things that I thought were in flux, and then just have, I wanted to have nothing stable. So it wasn't like, oh, there's this medicine many thing, and it's stable, that can't be revised. I wanted that to be revised too, and the whole str hierarchy further up. So the thought was, Suppose you're someone who thinks experts play a big role. I don't actually think, I don't think experts play a big role, but suppose you think that. Then what it is to be an expert and the role that expert plays can change over time. I mean, that's something that's not fixed. If you think uh, tokens, going back to this, to the actual amount of tokens and the pattern of tokens over a period of time matters, then as soon as you get computer tokens, the way to weigh that total amount of patterns, or that total amount of tokens and patterns of tokens could change as the technology changes. So, so insofar as the mechanism is one that takes you from a total use pattern, then the nature of that pattern and how you count it and how you weigh it will change, for example, as technology changes. That was the basic thought. Number one. That, 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 Five. So, why Zoe can be one? Zoe had 23 and didn't make it onto the list. Oh, sweet. All right. Oh. Well, thanks, guys. Um, let's see. Situation. We realized our concept's a disease. That's bad. Oh, no. What do we do? Project number one. Try to figure out what it would take to change the concept by changing the reference and then do the things that we think will raise the probability of that. Project number two. Try to figure out how to mitigate the pernicious impact of these bad concepts without changing them, and then do that, the stuff that we think raise the probability of mitigating the impact. So these are the two projects. In your answer to Annette, it seems like you like both of them. In the talk, it seems like you favor the second one. And I just like don't yet see why, because both of them face these huge epistemic obstacles. You've emphasized that we have little grasp of metasemantics and metamedesemantics. But we also like, don't have a great grasp of the facts about human cognition that will tell us what it takes to mitigate the effects of our disease concepts. And in both cases, there are also huge practical problems, namely that it's just difficult to get people to do the thing that we think is likely to improve the world. So why is the disease management like a more promising strategy than conceptual change? One to focus more on? 
I'm not sure. It maybe it comes across like I'm not. I I didn't really focus on the my slight. It's not optimism, but it's the sort of defeatist optimism. It's it's like the thing with children. Like you know you can't fix anything, but you just keep trying, and you can't. You shouldn't not keep trying, and it's just you just keep doing it. So I do think we should just keep doing that extremely hard thing. I, I, you, just, you can't not do it, and you should do it. So you know more, but it's but it's un, but let, let me finish. But it's unbelievably hard. And I do think my own personal day-to-day -day engagement with, say, generics, I think is a bit more within my control. That the things that aren't, you know, you guys can talk to me and use generics, then I get con infected by you. But I could try to be around people who I had agreed. That that does seem difficult, but very much less difficult than the total use pattern. All the billions of English speakers over a big, long period of time. I think there's just an order of magnitude difference in the degree level of difficulty. I have. Well, let's go to a different question. Uh, number seven. Whoa! I'm sorry, I get yeah. very agitated. I'm so okay. excited. Good. Uh, so I think that your claim that you're not concepts is sort of misguided because from my point of view you have more investment in concepts than you think. So if so I'm sympathetic with Bertree and Dave's point of view. So I have a different view about what language is for and what meanings are for. So we're organizing ourselves in complicated ways and in order to do that we have to get people to pay attention to certain partitions in logical space. Because those are the ones that we're using to organize ourselves. So pay attention to white and black, or pay attention to men and women, or pay attention to this and that. We find that paying attention to that, and it's, again, it's not a concept, it's just a set of dispositions and attention sort of processes and memory processes in our minds that are all kind of clustered around that partition. And what we see is clustering around that partition, and it doesn't have to have a word associated with it. So I, I think it's really, in fact, this morning it happened that in the US, on no forms do you ever have to put Mrs., right? I am not a Mrs. because Mrs. goes with the last name of your husband, and I don't have the last name of my husband. I would be Mrs. Yablo. I am not Mrs. Yablo. I am Sally Haslinger or Ms. Haslinger. But in the US, you never, ever, ever have to put Mrs. In Europe, to check in for a flight, you have to check between Mrs. and Mr. And it's appalling to me. Okay, but what that reflects is that we used to pay a lot of attention to this distinction between married or once married, so widowed women, and single eligible women. That was, we didn't have a word for it, right? It wasn't really, you know, because Ms., you know, anyway. So, so that partition of logical space was really, really, really important. What exactly the partition was, you know, of course we don't have, but there were clear cases, whatever. Now we don't do that anymore because we try to get people to shift their attention away from that. There are all kinds of devices to do that. In the, in, in, uh, after gay marriage in Massachusetts, you can't use mother and father on forms. You have to use parent, right? This is a very simple thing. And it has huge implications for who picks up the kids at school, who gets called when the kids are sick, all of these sorts of things. So what I think what I'm trying to say is that you've got a sense of what language is for, and you have this idea that we have this representation, even though you say you don't like concepts, that is sort of trapping this thing, and that's not what's going on. We have wedding rings. They have meanings. We have misses before our names. That has meanings. But it's all about getting people to pay attention to a particular partition. And there are a bazillion ways to get people to pay attention to a different partition when we see that that partition is not the morally, politically, you know, coordinationally the best one. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I really disagree. I think um, I agree that there are many ways to get people to pay attention to partitions. So I, I don't think I meant Well, that's, concepti to say anything. that's conceptual amelioration on my view. Okay, well, I, I, you, that's perfectly fine in the terminology. I was, I was just not talking about the other ways of doing it, which, which is something you could do. I was trying to think about the partitionings that come attached to vocabularies that we have. Wait, and my, my, let, me, let me just finish. So my thought is that, it, at least to some extent, the um, in 
terminology that we have that's given to us uh, dominates, to a certain extent dictates the distinctions and the partitions that we pay attention to. They shape partitionings for us. Now there are other ways of doing it. And then sometimes when you say use gendered language, uh, those partitions force you in a certain way and people will talk to you, use that terminology. Again, you're just forced into thinking in terms of those those partitions, and then you think, and then you think, yeah, but those aren't good ways to partition. But I can't, I can't help myself because you, or not you, but like other people will talk to me like that, and I don't know how to use terminology that avoids it. So I get drawn back to those partitionings, and then my thought is, well, you know, one way that would make really nice would be if I knew how to change the partitioning attached to gendered language, and then the stuff I no, was saying. Is that do, even responsive to your no, question? No, because what no. you do is you get people to, even though you, know, you change what kind of hairstyle and whether people wrap their breasts and what kind of clothing they wear, so they continue to use gendered language, but they no longer think it's a biological category. They start using the gendered language in different ways so that they don't think they're tracking genitalia anymore. That's called coming to change the concept of woman from a biological category to a social category. But you, you're proposing a strategy for change that's different. So if I understand this right, you're thinking, well, here's, a, here, here's, here's a way to change the, um, the thing that I was, I was talking about, use patterns, and, it was, and you're saying, don't think so much about the use patterns. Think about the sort of things, cluster of issues that you just mentioned. No, but the use and they, patterns. And they, and they, and they, and they, no, no, and then that just, you know, I, I, I didn't mean to say this. Just makes things harder. I think. You know, the, here's a, here's another kind of thing. The kind of clothing you wear, the kind of bathrooms you go to, the da 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 da, -da and there's a gazillion more things. And then, you know, Dave is like, yeah, but I, and I have a strategy. I know how to do it. And now, I'm like, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna include the bathrooms. I'm gonna include the underwear. I'm gonna include the use patterns. And that seems to me still quite. You know, it's not going to happen by June tomorrow. So now we got to live with it, and we got to figure out how to do it. That was the that was the picture. I know that doesn't make you happy, but <laughs> number five, Paul, <laughs> you made it. I got it. <laughs> I'm not even sure it's worth it, but um, uh, um, I mean, I, I don't. I think this may be something that's going on here. So you talk about the use. The use is an enormous thing, and it's very hard to know what it is and how to get from the use to the meaning and. Uh, but I think often when we're worried about a concept, it's some identifiable feature of its role. So that even if you don't know all the huge supervenience base or the rich principles that take you to the meaning, it's that thing you're worried about. So to use my standard cheery example of genocide, um, the, uh, the, one of the problems that there is is that there is a technical notion that's in international and then there is a concept that people use. They need to be using that thing that is a crime and one of the most heinous things that you can do and so on. But there is a disconnect between the concept that people use and the technical definition in the UN law. And that is that in, in, in most people's minds, genocide involves mass murder. Whereas if you look at the technical definition, it, you can have genocide without mass murder, without a single death. So the, here there is a disconnect. Something has to happen. And one of the things that you can do is fix the technical definition or get people to adjust their informal notion so that it doesn't impose the requirements that aren't, in fact, covered by international law. All of this by way of saying there's an identifiable feature. You don't need to know the entire mass of things that, that you were invoking in order to fix that particular problem. Um, I, I don't think I disagree about the idea that we can identify. So, that, so my, I don't know, the kind of toy pictures of how this process works is you do identify defects. That's your first, yeah. you find some feature, or it's a cluster of features that you think is defective. So I agree with that part. And so this would be an illustration of finding but a I feature. I think many of the cases are like that. I think yeah, but I'm, I'm not, not going to agree with you. <laughs> then, then, and, then, and then you think, OK, well, I want to change this. And then the issues of how you change that feature to something else, like replace it with something else in the folk concept. I agree that the legal case is special, and I can say something about the legal case. Uh, with how you replace that defective feature or remove it, that's the part I was talking about. I don't think that's, I don't think there's some hand wavy, oh, we just sort of 
change that. I don't, that's the part that I'm, I don't think you know how to do that. Now, I do think in the legal case, it's special. Can I just quickly say something about the legal case? But I don't think the legal, I think we're, the legal case doesn't change the meaning of words. I don't think that corporations are persons, even though the Supreme Court has said that they are. And they can say whatever they want about it, and it's never going to be. What they can do is they can use police force to uh, or, you know, like the threat of imprisonment or fines or something to force people to interpret uh, the word person such that it includes, but that's just forced interpretation. It's not a change of meaning. So, so the legal cases don't, I think, help much. Um, quick question, any US slides? US slides. Okay, then let's Online. thank us. <laughs>